All right. So for this morning, we're going to talk about classroom assessment in the new normal. And when you talk about classroom assessment, we now look at its adaptation on how we can actually deliver this one across different delivery modalities. And the objective for this particular session is for you to be able to use appropriate forms and approach in assessing students' learning. Now, take note that um, we're talking about two different structures of assessment here. One would that be of the forms, and the other one would be in terms of the approach. And this is um, something that we'll have to um, look at and distinguish, and how do we implement these forms and approaches across different flexible learning modalities. And here are the points that we're going to um, take up in this session. First is the idea of assessment for flexible learning. And then how do we integrate assessment in an online lesson? And how do we implement and distinguish formative and summative assessment? And how do we distinguish written and performance tasks? Because these are two forms of assessment that we actually upgrade, especially if these are summative. Okay, um, to begin with, we're actually guided on how we actually conduct assessment in the Philippines at the start of um, 2020 when we went through the pandemic and students go through remote learning within a home-based learning environment. So this is the DEPED Order 31 series of 2020, and this is the assessment and grading in the light of the learning continuity plan. In this particular DEPED order, there are actually five important principles of assessment that are mentioned. Okay, the first one is that assessment should be holistic and authentic in capturing the attainment of the most essential learning competencies. What we're emphasizing here is that every time we make assessment in the K-12, to our assessment are actually aligned to each of the learning competencies. And this reduced version and the decongested version of these learning competencies from the K-12 curriculum guide is now our MELC or the most essential learning competencies. Um, take note that there is a reduction in the number of learning competencies so that we can allow and give time for our learners to go through self-paced learning across synchronous and asynchronous modalities. And there should be an assessment that corresponds to each learning competency so that we get an evidence whether each one are actually reached by our learners. And this is what is being said in the first principle. The second one is that assessment is integral for understanding student learning and development. When we now think about assessment, we now look at how the students perform, how the student responds with our instruction. And given that, the teachers should be able to understand how the learning process occurs. And given that, they should be able to come up with relevant instruction given what the students know and do not know given what the students can do and cannot do, and given some of their misconceptions and misunderstanding of the lesson. So the instruction now is actually tailored based on the students' weak areas. The third principle is that a variety of assessment strategies is necessary with formative assessment, taking priority to inform the teaching and promote growth and mastery. So when we go through a particular learning module, a learning module is represented by a learning competency. And with that, activities, part of those activities in the learning module would be a series of assessment. It means to say that assessment does not only occur once at the end of the lesson, but we're now looking at assessment that is ongoing during instruction and even assessment is conducted before the lesson. And there are now different purposes on why we need to conduct assessment before and during the lesson. And this is now part of the formative assessment. 
we want to see whether students are actually um, continuously progressing towards the learning competency that we are teaching them in that module. In that way, we are now able to look at students' growth and mastery if we provide several assessment strategies for a particular learning competency and track students' progress towards that learning competency. The fourth one is that assessment and feedback should be a shared responsibility among teachers, learners, and their families. So now the parents, our home learning partners, which we now call them HLP, takes now an active role in terms of conducting the assessment. Before, it was mostly the teacher within the face-to-face -face, um, learning environment, but uh, now um, there should be an understanding, there should be an orientation among home learning partners that they have an active role. And part of these um, active role in the conduct of assessment is to provide feedback on the work of the learner. What do you mean that they provide feedback on the work of the learner? They have to ensure that the learner completes the task. When the tasks are submitted within a home-based learning environment, they need to look at the quality of that task based on the set of standards found in the rubric provided by the teacher. Feedback can be provided to the learner based on the set of criteria in order for the learner to, be, to become aware whether they are reaching these particular sets of standards or not, the set of criteria so that the learner will now have an opportunity to revise and improve their work before submitting it to the teacher. So these are examples of some shared responsibility that home learning partners actually conduct. And there's much sense of um, awareness that we need to um, orient home learning partners regarding this particular role. Especially now that we're beginning the school year, one of the activities that we do with the parents is an orientation. Um, on how they actually facilitate and contribute to the home-based learning environment that is going to happen. Lastly, assessment and grading should have a positive impact on the learner. If the assessment is able to help the learners progress, therefore, towards the end, when the teachers provide now the final assessment, which we call summative, students should be able to accomplish the task successfully given the support and practice provided during the formative assessment. And therefore, it now builds a positive impact on their learning. In our presentation this afternoon, we're going to focus on the second, third, and fourth principle of the DEPID Order 31, which is assessment and grading in the light of the learning continuity plan. First is that let's take a look at the model on flexible learning delivery. So this model was created by our center and it explains flexible learning delivery on two dimensions. The first dimension is the location of the learner. The location of the learner could be inside the school setting, which we now call face-to-face. -face. And learning can also take place when the learner is outside of the school setting, which we now call as the distance or remote learning, which is on the other end of the continuum. The other dimension that explains flexible learning delivery is how we deliver instruction and the learning materials to the learner. It runs on two opposite ends where instruction and the learning materials are delivered through online or through a purely offline delivery. In the Philippine setting, our online delivery is when the learner makes use of internet connection with their device to receive instruction and the learning materials. And offline delivery would mean the printed learning modules that um, the students actually goes through because they have no access to the internet and to their device. When we now intersect these two dimensions, okay, it now produces four quadrants. Quadrant one and quadrant two happens within a face-to-face -face learning environment, except that for quadrant one, um, instruction has technology integration. So it means to say that there are some lessons that are delivered with the use of applications and with the use of devices. Some activities in certain legs and segments of the lesson are delivered with the use of devices rather than simply the book or 
a paper and pen task. There's also a form here of blended learning because some other parts of the lesson are delivered, making use of traditional modalities such as print materials. And other modalities would be making use of technology. That's why there is blended learning. Of course, in quadrant one and quadrant two, the teacher is present inside the classroom that facilitates the teaching and the learning process. We emphasize now much on the third quadrant and the fourth quadrant, Q3 and Q4, because this is where we are in now. In the third quadrant, okay, this is mostly private schools in the Philippines, but not all private schools. Okay, there is purely technology integration to facilitate the teaching and the learning process because the learner needs to open and use their device to receive instruction to interact with the teacher, and to receive the learning materials through their own device, and they're connected to the internet. There's also blended learning here because there are some sessions that are scheduled, which we call synchronous, and some sessions that where the learner goes through the learning material on their own, which we call as the asynchronous session. The role now of the parent here and the tutor, these are the home learning partners um, are activated, especially when the learners goes through the asynchronous session. And the teacher is present online during the synchronous um, session and during discussion board session. So discussion boards are also considered to be synchronous. If the student have some questions, um, during self-paced learning, then they can um, send these questions to the teacher and wait a little bit later until the teacher sends their answers. Now, much of the challenge occurs in the fourth quadrant. So um, in quadrant four, the learner has no access to the device and to the internet. So they receive a printed module. In some instances, um, the contents of the module are saved in a flash drive or in a mobile drive. And these mobile drives are actually sent to the learner and they open these mobile drives, making use of their own device. Of course, um, the varied teaching and learning processes also occurs. And the teacher can make use of a range of pedagogies uh, when the learner goes through the content of the learning material. The role now of the parents, the tutors, or any adults who is um, supervising the learner at home is very critical because the teacher will not be present all of the time. And if there are some questions, the parent okay, would be there to help provide and seek the answers. Um, the parent and the tutor or different home learning partners are there to provide feedback on the work of the child and to monitor whether the learner completes the material to ensure that they go through the material and to ensure that learning is taking place. In some cases where the teacher could not get any feedback or any news from the learner and the learner is not able to submit these exercises, the teacher visits. If we now translate that particular um, model into assessment, Okay, we now look at the same dimension. However, assessment now takes place, okay, in a different modalities as well. So again, in quadrant one and in quadrant two, this is where the teacher administers some forms of assessment. The teacher provides the instructions on how to accomplish learning tasks. The learners answer in front of the teacher. The learners present, demonstrates, conducts the work in front of the teacher and the teacher monitors. In quadrant three, that is very much possible. Assessment can be structured before, during, and after the assessment as part of the online learning module, where the student goes through a set of exercises. Um, assessment, of course, in quadrant three happens within a home-based learning environment. And when the learner goes through written forms of assessment where the teacher will have to um, monitor them to ensure that they are the ones who are really answering 
to ensure that they are not minimizing their screen when they answer, the teacher may require some video monitoring where the learner turns on their video cam so that the teacher can actually um, take a look at um, what is going on and whether the learner is actually the one answering. And the home learning partners are provided with some guidelines on how to monitor and to ensure that the learner is answering the task, especially for summative assessment. In the fourth quadrant, we encourage much of a performance-based task. We encourage much of constructed responses so that the responses um, are going to be unique for the learner. And these responses are actually sent to the teacher. Um, I have seen some divisions that implemented their assessment in quadrant four, where they provided some drop box and on strategic locations of the barangays in local government units and the nearby schools. Um, in these drop boxes, they put their answers to some of the assessment tasks on a scheduled um, date. And then the teacher picks it up on a certain time of the day. Um, the teacher does the marking and the checking and does the feedback. The teacher returns it. Okay, and then um, there's a scheduled um, pickup again coming from the learner so that the learners will be able to um, receive the feedback and the marking coming from the teacher. So this is how the teacher actually monitors student progress by sending out the answers. If these are products, okay, from summative assessment, um, the learner actually sends the actual project, the actual work output in that Dropbox, and then the teacher receives it, and they now have an opportunity to provide feedback and mark the work. So this is how assessment happens across different flexible learning modalities. The idea now here is that if the teaching and the learning process um, is possible across different modalities, and so as assessment, so it doesn't necessarily mean that um, if we are in a remote learning environment that assessment will not take place anymore. That is a mistaken idea because if teaching and learning is flexible across different quadrants, across these different four modalities, so as assessment. The only aspect that was changed is that we do not administer the quarterly assessment for this school year because much of the assessment is devoted and disaggregated across the quarter through the summative assessment. When we took out the quarterly assessment, we are not giving an idea that assessment is not possible. We are just disaggregating the assessment and distributing it across the quarter so that we get a better picture of the evidence for each of the learning competency. Okay, um, let's, let's take note that the purpose of um, providing assessment is to help students learn. And this is the idea of what we call assessment for learning. When we change that preposition from assessment of learning to assessment for learning, the concept and the idea of conducting assessment changes much. This time, when we say assessment for learning, we now gather information, we now gather evidences of student learning because we need this information to help the learners learn better. We now use these assessment results to make relevant instruction, to continuously adjust our instruction to make it appropriate given the specific weaknesses of our learners. So this is assessment for learning. Now, when we now attempt to implement these purpose of assessment, assessment for learning across the different modalities. This is now what we call as assessment for flexible learning or AFFL. In the idea of the AFFL, we now add two important characteristics of assessment. One, we need to make assessment accessible at various modes of the instructional delivery. Second, we need to continuously improve the delivery of our assessment and the assessment that we conduct are good evidences whether our flexible learning delivery is of quality. Okay, let's begin with quality of our assessment. It's very important for the schools to realize that quality assessment is their responsibility 
providing standards on which to follow when we conduct assessment across the different modalities is correct, accurate, valid, and reliable. And this is the responsibility of the school through the teachers. And we need to be guided with this set of standards that we need to follow. And our center has created standards on flexible learning delivery and co what coincides with the different aspects of these standards is how we conduct assessment appropriately. There are four standards that we have developed and there are specific indicators for each of these standards. And this can be downloaded on the link that is shown on the screen. So first standard provides us indicators on how we develop learning resources. Okay, if we are in an online modality or offline modality and how we create modules are provided in this particular standard. Okay, the second one, we provided standards on learning delivery or how we teach across different modalities. We also made standards on what should be the role of the parents and guardians and tutors to support the learners across different flexible learning modalities. And we also provided um, ways on how we monitor and evaluate flexible learning Modality. So the complete article containing the standards and indicators can be um, downloaded in this particular link. Okay, the second aspect that we added in the, in the idea of assessment for flexible learning is making assessment accessible across the teaching and the learning process. Meaning to say, assessment needs to be part of our regardless of whether we are implementing an online and offline delivery mode assessment needs to be part of the teaching and the learning process where assessment is strategically located and conducted before instruction during instruction and after instruction what happens now and what is the purpose why do we do uh, assessment before instruction we wanted to determine what the learner knows and do not know what the learner can do and do not and uh, could not do some of these mis misconceptions of the learners and some of the confusions of the learners so that immediately once we are able to know their particular weaknesses we are able to address that right then and there there is immediate feedback provided to the learner there is an immediate correction provided to the learner where we don't have to wait for the lengthy instruction before we are able to address those particular weaknesses so the question that we now ask is Okay, what instruction will be relevant for the learner? Because we now use these information that we um, gather before instruction to make adjustments in our instruction. Okay, next, of course, would be we now start to deliver the instruction. After we deliver the instruction, we assess the learners. While we are teaching, we stop at certain segments of our instruction in order to check if our learners are understanding with the, with the activities, with the reading materials and stimuli that we provide to the learner. We are able to determine here whether the learners are progressing over time. We're able to determine in the process who among the learners are still having difficulty and what areas in their learning still needs to be improved. If we found out from our initial assessment during instruction that the learn that there are still some learners who are not able to answer and master the task, then we provide another form of reteaching. After that, another form of reteaching, we assess the learner again. And if we found out from that um, assessment that there are still some learners that are not able to um, answer well, we provide another form of reteaching. So what happens in the during instruction is a segment and an iteration of teach, assess, teach, assess, teach, assess. We are doing this because we want to provide further support to the learner. So we ask ourselves the question here, what further support can be provided to the learners so that they can progress towards the learning competency that we are teaching? Towards the end okay, of our um, instruction, okay, we um, provide assessment again. We are now able to determine here how many learners still need help, need help. And with that final assessment, we now decide whether the learners are now ready to take 
the summative assessment or not. Because if not, then you decide whether you need to have another round of reteaching. So we ask ourselves a question here, what resources and further instructions okay, can be provided to those who still need help? Okay, um, Ian, okay, you're ready now? Sige pa, the car, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so you will see here a particular um, segment of instruction, okay, where we demonstrate how assessment is made accessible okay we are able to make assessment accessible if it is part of the learning module that is gone through by the learner okay for example this is your usual um, format for a learning module that the learner goes through it begins with a set of learning competency where the learning target the objective of the lesson um, is um, presented to the learner. So the learner becomes aware of what their learning target is, what they need to do, what they need to go through. That's a learning competency. Then usually in the learning module, we need to provide a pre-assessment. Okay? And um, it's indicated here that the pre-assessment can be a form of an asynchronous learning. Okay. And then... Um, usually, the teachers provide some motivation and conducts the lesson proper. Um, then afterwards, there is, again, another form of assessment that is asynchronous. Okay, um, Ian, if you, look at, uh, if you look at this one, uh, what do you think is the reason why is the pre-assessment asynchronous at the beginning? Asynchronous, it means to say that the learner goes through that pre-assessment on their own. Hmm. Uh, teacher is not monitoring, teacher is not yet present. Okay, they just open, for example, um, their learning module and they do the assessment on their own and it's asynchronous. What do you think is the rationale behind this? Ako, Dr. Card, my take on it is that this is to allow learners to reflect on their competencies and mm -hmm. also to maybe gauge kung hanggang saan yung kaya nila in terms of the lessons that are uh, going to be offered. Okay, yes. That is the purpose of giving the pre-assessment. And if you look into the next segment, there's now motivation mm -hmm. and the lesson proper. So how is now the teacher guided in when they start to design the motivation and the lesson proper? What is now the role of that pre-assessment when the teacher starts to design their motivation and their lesson proper? Hmm. I think the card it's really to tailor to mm -hmm. yung current level nila based on that assessment and also okay. to and also to address yung what motivates them to learn, for example. So it's really addressing their need and even their style of learning. Okay. okay. And the need is determined when? Um through the asset the pre assessment. Yes. Okay. The need. Okay. Those needs, those, those motivational needs, um, those competency needs are actually yes. determined during the pre-assessment. So it's okay. very important that the teacher needs to look at the results of the pre-assessment first. Mm -hmm. Then they make some readjustments in their motivation and the lesson proper. And then Ian, um, look that there's an assessment again. Why is there an assessment again after the lesson proper? Hmm. Siguro, Doc Card, it's really to check kung nagawa ba ng teacher yung, yung tamang alignment of the pre-assessment and the actual lesson. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, what uh, are we assessing here now in this assessment after the lesson proper? What do we want to determine? Um, I would say yung gaps. Like, for example, okay, nag-determine natin na kulang yung competencies ng bata for this particular lesson. Mm -hmm. Tapos nagbigay ka na ng lesson, pero hindi mo pa rin na-address. So meaning, um, may, may kulang ba dun sa lesson? Or maybe there's uh, additional lessons that need to be done for the Okay, for the yes. Learning. Okay, yes. So you now conduct that assessment after the lesson proper to check again if the learners okay gained mm -hmm. after that motivation and lesson proper. And if there are still some learners that are not able to take on some gains, look at the next one, Ian, there's now reteaching. Re Why do we need to do reteaching? Re sir, as mentioned, no, if 
the lesson was not proper or the the need for the new lessons were not addressed or the gaps were not addressed. Ito na, it's an opportunity to reteach those lessons. Mm -hmm. Yes. And then, of course, that reteaching is followed by another round of assessment. assessment. Why? Yes. Again, no, parang check siya na parang, okay, na-meet na ba talaga natin? If okay. we succeed tayo in that reteaching, then good. If not, then maybe another round of reteaching would okay. be merited. Yes. Okay, so you will notice, Ian, that from the pre-assessment going down to that assessment after um, reteaching are all tagged as asynchronous. Um, when the teacher starts to design this one, uh, the motivation and the lesson proper can be a set of instruction where the learners are referred to a particular part of the manual or a particular page of the book that they can actually read. After going through that reading, okay, assessment um, occurs. After that assessment, which is asynchronous, the student again goes through that reteaching, which is asynchronous again. In this particular aspect, the teacher can actually prepare a video of the same learning competency, teaching the same lesson for the reteaching. So you see, there's now a difference in terms of the strategy. The lesson proper is independent reading, and the reteaching could be in the form of a video or the teacher can record a video of himself or herself teaching and all of these are asynchronous however after that assessment um look at the that the reteaching with feedback it's now synchronous why do you think Ian, that i designed it this way that the segments of assessment teaching assessment and reteaching are all asynchronous and then i made it last the synchronous reteaching why do you think that I place the, the, the reteaching as asynchronous after teaching, assessment, reteaching, and assessment? Yeah. Mm, how about, Doc Carl, we, we also open the floor to our <laughs> live viewers, <laughs> diba? Para mas ano tayo, mas interactive. Um, kasi, would they kasi be Doc, able to speak? Um, meron po tayo, Doc Carl, na... Mga comments. Like, for example, okay. Dr. Carl, we have one question from our mm -hmm. live viewer. Um, are these synchronous or asynchronous designations for each mm -hmm. module element hard and fast? Should these be made uh, hard and fast? Yun po yung question ng ating live viewer, Dr. Carl. Okay. Before we actually um, answer that question, mm -hmm. let's look into the idea here. Why did we provide a set of asynchronous mm -hmm. um, segments before we planned for the synchronous? Yeah. Uh, go ahead, Ian. I think your answer for this question that I'm asking would answer that one. Mm. Mm. So it means to say the learners will have to go through the lesson independently on their own yes. first. Yes. And then afterwards, yes. it's the only time that the teacher will schedule a session. Why was it structured that way? Ang take ko doon, Doc Carl, is that hindi siya ganun ka intimidating because you were able to do the assessment on your own and then the mm -hmm. synchronous part Ian, I have it um, here on the next slide, so it will be answered on the succeeding slides. But um, let okay, me demonstrate immediately. Ahead, okay, um, yeah, there's a pre-assessment here that is actually answered by the learner. Okay, if this is a written work, the ones with the right and wrong answer, the learner can actually um, um, accomplish that one first, and then the parent will bring out the answer key and the learner can check on their own given the answer key. So it means to say that the answer key is only given by the parent after the learner accomplishes the pre-assessment. So then the learner reads through the motivation and the lesson proper. Then the learner goes through an assessment again. If the assessment, let's say, is written, same style is done, but if the assessment is performance-based, um, the learner will have to um, read carefully what the instructions are, goes through and conducts the performance task. Parents takes a look at the takes a look at the the performance, okay, and provides feedback. And then the learner goes through the print module again for the reteaching, and then assessment is done again. Okay, then of course there's no synchronous, okay. 
But then towards the end, the learner creates the summative assessment. Now, the pre-assessment and the second leg of the assessment and the third leg of the assessment, if the teacher wants to chart the progress of the learners in these three assessments, which are formative, okay, the one way is the learners can actually save it in the flash drive, but if they don't have any device, okay, they can tear out that particular um, part of the printed module with answers, okay, they fold it, they label it properly with their names and address and contact number, and then strategically, they send it to the teacher either through a kiosk, a drop box, or a designated place where the teacher can collect it. The teacher checks, okay, and then um, um, returns it back to the same um, kiosk or drop box, and then the learner picks it up for to, to determine how they actually um, fared to get the feedback, and then they do some revision. So that's strategically how they will um, submit the formative assessment. And same structure is followed for the summative assessment in the end. In some instances, if the summative assessment um, is a written work, the ones with right and wrong answer, okay, um, then the school head or the principal okay, collaborates with some parent representatives, okay? And the parent representatives are the ones who are going to hand, go to the house and hand over the test paper to the learner. And then they wait for the learner to answer you. But these items are only about 10 to 15 items. So that's going to be fast. The learner answers in front of that parent representative and then they collect it and then it's given back to the teacher. So these are some ways on how you do it for print modules. The strength of that particular procedure is actually um, going to be implemented well, depending on how well the school head and the school leaders would partner with some representatives in the community. Okay. Ian? Okay. Let's now go through the go next. The um, mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, probably, Ian, let's go through the other questions um, when we finish the succeeding uh, slides. All right, let's go to the next one. If you look into the structure, Ian, it's actually from the learning competency down to the, down to the synchronous session, this is where formative assessment happens, okay? And um, summative assessment happens towards the end. So it means to say that formative is given first and formative is a segment of teach, assess, teach, assess before the summative assessment is provided. All right, um, we, uh, let's have the second one to have a conversation with. Um, Ian, what was the name of the other, um, other? Sir Mike? Uh, Sir Mike, yeah, Sir Mike, you're ready. Uh, I think Sir Mike is, um, is in the Facebook uh, chat right now, Doc Card. I think uh, it's best for if we go ahead Paul, with the lecture or with the, your okay. presentation and then we'll go through the Q&A later na lang, no, card. Okay. Uh, uh, so again, Ian, you will have to go through this one with you Ako in a conversation. <laughs> Sige, all right, no, card. <laughs> all right. So I have here some cases, Ian. And you'll have to identify whether the case illustrates a formative assessment or a summative assessment. Okay. Look at the first one. The teacher provides drills and exercises in math after demonstrating the addition of decimals for practice. After checking, the addition is taught again for the learners who could not get the correct answer. Is this formative or summative? Formative. Okay, why is this formative, Ian? Because mm, there's retooling that happens. Yes, yes. And uh, the retooling uh, is specifically what happened in the retooling. Um, the addition is taught again for the learner. Yes, 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 yes. That's the retooling. The addition is taught again, especially for those who could not get the correct answer. This is not going to be formative, Ian, if there is no reteaching again. Mm -hmm. If this only, if this is only the, uh, the, the drills and exercises without the reteaching, without the teaching again, then it is simply assessment and not formative. So the reteaching is part of the make up of a formative assessment. All right, the next one, Ian. The teacher gave several short stories to be read by the learners. In each story, the characters and setting are identified. Students who could not identify the characters and setting well are provided with additional learning materials. 
Mm-hmm. Parang medyo confused ako dito, Doc Card. I'd like Look to at the second sentence. Look at the last there. sentence. Uh-oh. Yeah, uh, I, I, students who could not identify the characters in setting well are provided with additional yeah. learning materials. All right. Um, mm. I'm inclined to say the car that it's still formative. Mm-hmm. It is formative, except okay, that good. it's there's a different strategy <laughs> on how the retooling, yeah. the reteaching is done. Mm. Here, it's taught again. That's how we did the reteaching. But here, how is the support provided further to the learner uh, the provision of additional learning material correct so it doesn't necessarily mean that we'll have to um, teach it like over and over again if we can provide some additional um, learning materials for the students to do it independently on their own then that is also a form of reteaching after the assessment so this is formative uh, next one ian after several exercises on problem solving involving factoring of polynomials, 95% of the learners are able to execute the task. They are given a test to determine if they are ready to move to the next learning competency. Mm, this one is summative. Uh, why? What is your indication here that this is summative? Uh, my judgment na eh. <laughs> It's the 95% and then they were given that test to determine if they are ready or not to move okay. to the next learning Okay, yes, competency. because the purpose now is to move to the next learning competency. That's the next lesson, okay? That's why this is summative. Mm-hmm. Next one, Ian. The, t- the teacher in PE allows the students to practice the folk dance and feedback is provided. Mm-hmm. So when the students are practicing, teacher is giving feedback. Okay, move here, dance gracefully, okay? Yeah. Parang summative din to, Doc Hart. Uh, students are still practicing. Are Ian. still practicing. Okay, formative, mm. pala. Formative. Yeah, so this is formative. <laughs> While um, practice is being done, yes. okay, yes. teacher is giving feedback. Okay, smile when you dance. Okay, so mm-hmm. this is still formative. Formative. Okay, yes. look at the next one, Ian. After practicing how to play tennis, the students are informed to have a final demonstration of the sport. After mm. practicing. Okay, pero uh, may final demonstration of the sport. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Parang nalilito ako dito, Doc Art. <laughs> pero sige, uh, I'll go with um, formative pa din. Uh, Ian, practice summative. is done. Okay, after practice. practice is done. Okay. Yeah, summative. and it's summative. now a final demonstration. Uh, yeah, take note, Ian, that um, mm-hmm. the summative can be both paper and pen, Mm-hmm. or performance. a performance. So okay. the final demonstration is, is the summative. Okay. Mm-hmm. Okay, uh, next, Ian. Students submitted their draft of their essays and feedback with corrections are indicated by the teacher. The students were requested to revise the essay based on the feedback. Um, summative? Mm. But mm. the students are going to revise it again. Very re- revise pa. Okay, sige, mm. formative ito. This is formative. <laughs> yes. Okay, when every time that the student goes to the revision, uh, mm. feedback okay. revision stage, it's still formative. Mm. Okay, you stop the, the revision when the learners are able to meet all of the criteria mm. already. Okay. okay, next one, Ian. After the students have revised the teacher's correction on their science investigatory report, okay, the work mm-hmm. is checked using a rubric. This one is summative <laughs> na talaga. Okay, yes, this one yeah. is summative. Okay, Ian, this is what we went through a while ago. Okay? And um, this answers the question a while ago. Mm-hmm. How do we do it? How do we now conduct the formative and the summative assessment um, across different modalities? Okay, let's start with the formative assessment. How do we check? How do we mark? If you're going through an online uh, modality, you can actually make use of your Google Forms, MS Forms, or exam.net, or you can directly um, put um, the items of your assessment directly in your in the learning management system that you're using. Uh, these are examples of learning management system uh, seen on the screen. And then um, if the assessment requires a right and wrong answer, they are 
automatically scored and the learner is able to see immediately the score. If these are constructed responses, like open responses such as your essay or short answer, okay, um, the teacher receives the responses and checks it using the rubric. Feedback is actually sent okay, to the learner via discussion board or these feedback are provided to the entire class during the synchronous session. And uh, What's good about um, doing the online is that um, the students' progress can be tabulated, okay? And then the students can track their progress if they are improving or not from the first formative to the next formative to the next formative. And if the students are going through the print module, this is what we have described a while ago, the answer key is provided by the parents, okay, after the student goes through the exercise and the parents can check. If this is a performance task, the parents can provide feedback based on the criteria. If this is a summative assessment, again, um, the, the, the same platforms can be used and it can be directly placed in the learning management system. However, since this is already the summative assessment and um, the learner needs to answer, let's say, for example, a right and wrong task, Okay, there's now video monitoring where the teacher can actually look at what is going on and whether it's the learner who is answering. Same goes for open-ended responses or constructed responses where the teacher needs to um, do some video monitoring while the learner is answering. If this is going to be a print module, so the task is submitted to the teacher on designated stations, if this is performance-based, but if it requires a right and wrong answer, then somebody will have to um, deliver to the school and wait for the learner to accomplish that, like what we have demonstrated a while ago. Now, um, the role of the parents, okay, are clarified and distinguished, okay, whether what they need to do during the formative assessment or in the summative assessment. So it's very important that in the learning modules, the kind of assessment that we provide to the learners are tagged as formative or summative so that the learners can actually, um, uh, so that the parents can actually uh, shift their role when it is formative and when it is summative. And this is um, actually um, explained and all of the indicators are detailed in this particular article. And this is where you can access the article. I'll send the slide um, later so that they can uh, download the articles. Okay, now here's a summary on what the parents can do during the formative and the summative assessment. Okay, one is um, during the formative assessment, okay, the parents can reiterate the instructions. Okay, it's okay because it's still formative. Take note that the formative assessment is not graded. What is graded is the summative. Okay, um, during the formative assessment, the parents can rephrase the task for the learners to understand um, the instructions well. Um, they can demonstrate how to get the correct answer for one of the items or for one of the tasks. They can provide other examples if they can. And if they want, they can provide additional tasks. They can create exercises on their own. And they can also demonstrate how the answer was derived. And they can allow the child to revise the answer. And of course, they need to check the work of the learner during the formative assessment. However, what happens during the summative? This is now the part that the task is graded by the teacher. So the parent during the summative assessment needs to keep quiet during the entire assessment period. There is no need for them to reiterate the instruction anymore because the instruction has actually been um, practiced during the formative. No need to rephrase because it should be the same instruction provided during the summative. There is no need for them to demonstrate because that should have been done during the formative. Um, other examples are provided during the summative. So no need for the parents to provide examples during the summative. If the parent wants to provide additional tasks, they are provided prior to the summative, okay? If the parent wants to demonstrate how the answer is derived, they can do it after the student submits their answers. So if it's clear for the parent when are the formative done and accomplished by the learner and when the summative is accomplished by the learner, they can now shift their particular roles. And this is something that the schools needs to explain to the parents on what they need to do during the orientation. Okay? Um, Dr. Carl, excuse lang po. Yeah. Uh, we have some comments from our live viewers. Uh, okay, go ahead. Mm -hmm. um, the first one is, 
The problem is the students nowadays now are not used to being independent because they grew in an environment where everything should be spoon fed. So, what's your mm. comment on that, Doc Car? Um, yeah, this is um, an over generalization because not all learners are dependent. Okay, it depends on the degree of dependence and independence that the learner um, is. Now, if you have the, the the most important part here is that if you have seen that the learner is very much dependent um, for adults. Then it means to say that there is now a particular need for that learner to become independent. So the strategy here is that little by little, okay, the responsibility, the role of the active learning is shifted to the learner. It means to say that there are some tasks that are guided with the help of the parent. But for some tasks, the parent moves away. For some tasks, the parent comes in again. So little by little, okay? It's actually um, where the, the parent actually helps. And then little by little, until such a time comes that the learner can um, do it independently on their own, the parent detaches themselves or the home learning partner detaches themselves. Okay, um, let's, um, let's um, illustrate that a little bit further. If you have seen that the learner is very... Um, dependent. And in one particular lesson, there's about five tasks that the learners will have to do. Perhaps for the first uh, task, the parent would be there in front of them, watching them while they answer. In the second task, okay, for the first five items, the parent is there. But for the next five items, the parent starts to move away. On the third task, okay, if there are, um, again, five items on the third task, okay, the parent is there watching on the first two items, but on the last three items, the parent moves away. Okay, on the fourth task, the parent takes a look at the learner only on the first item and moves away when the succeeding tasks are done, when succeeding items are done. On the fifth task, the learner will have to do it independently on their own. So this is a particular strategy on how the parent can little by little teach the learner on how to become independent. It begins by fully um, being present to fully shifting the role of the independence and the active role-taking to the learner. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks, Dr. Carl. Uh, another comment po from our live viewers. Uh, for learning modules, I like how assessment should be integrated in the learning modules. However, though, if we're going to look at DepEd student learning modules, these type of assessments are integrated per week with one-to-many mm. topics compressed in one module instead mm. of having a module per topic, not per mm. competencies. What's your comment uh, on that's, that? Uh, yeah, Ian, that's false because I went through all of the SLM. I reviewed all of the SLM, Ian, because that is my project with the Asian Development mm -hmm. Bank because we're digitizing all of the LS SLM, okay, from grade seven until senior high school. Um, if you will be looking at the most essential learning competencies, Ian, one essential learning competency represent one SLM or one self-learning module. There's just unpacking of the topics for one SLM. So it is not true that there are several objectives in that SLM and um, there are several uh, there are several topics that needs to be assessed because take note Ian that we are not assessing the topic, we are assessing directly the learning competency. And if you will look at the structure of the SLM, Ian, there's input okay, coming from the lesson, and then it's followed by um, an assessment. Then there's another form of reteaching, and then it's followed by an assessment. It's really an iteration. And I've seen that the formative assessment are strategically indicated within a structure of assess, teach, assess, teach, assess, teach. And towards the end, there's really a summative assessment provided, Ian. And I even trained the, the, the education program supervisors, okay, on how to process the results of each leg of assessment in the SLM in a national training workshop. And we looked at the structure of the SLM and it follows that way. Yeah, Ian. Okay. Thanks we need for to the look at carefully. Uh, yeah, we need to take uh, care, look at carefully on the structure of the SLM because I've seen it and I'm working on it, and I'm con I'll continue to work on it even after this particular session. I'm on the science mm -hmm. right now. <laughs> yeah. 
Okay. Doctor, last uh, comment po okay. before you proceed to your um, presentation. Um, we are do uh, we are dealing with great disparities in the resources and support mm. available for our students. Some mm-hmm. have devices. Some for uh, some do not. Mm. Um, and some are sharing with parents and siblings. Mm. Uh, others also have insufficient bandwidth to accomplish mm. their assigned tasks. So mm-hmm. some parents are fortunate to be able to work at home, while mm-hmm. some parents must leave home, go to mm-hmm. work, and many have lost employment. So mm-hmm. what's your comment on that? Uh, okay. Parang, yeah, the disparity yeah. Okay. of opportunities like those. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, first and foremost, that's why it's called flexible. When you say flexible learning modalities, whatever time, whatever pacing will work for the learner to go through the teaching and the learning process during their own time together with the parent or a home learning partner is feasible. That's why it's a flexible learning delivery. So it means to say that if the parent is working daytime, the, 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 some of the tasks can be done by the learner on their own during daytime. And when the parent comes home, that's the time that the parents can take a look at, okay, can take a look at um, the work of the learner. Kaya nga self-paced and it is flexible. We are not saying that the parent um, would be there the entire day. We need to work out with a schedule that is workable between the parent and the learner. And take note, it's not only the parent who can take on that particular responsibility. That's why we call them as home learning partners. If the school now has a good um, data, a survey on how many of the parents are working full time on eight hours, uh, eight hours, the parents can actually structure home learning partners that can actually come and visit the learner, or these home learning partners are strategically represented across the different geographic location of the area. And so that in case that when the learner is going through the module on their own, and if they have some question, they can and the present is and the parent is not present at home, they can now go to this particular person and ask questions. This is the idea of a home learning partner. Okay, devices. What if the parent um, have the cell phones and they are working and the cell phones are not there? So how can they go through the 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 task? Okay. So the learners receives, even if they are in an online modality, also receives the printed module. So the learners can go through the printed learning modules um, as well, even without the devices. Okay, now, what if in my class, I have some learners who have devices, some learners who do not have devices. Therefore, you will now have to double your modality as well. Okay, for those learners without devices, go to the print module, go to the designated stations to check the work of the learners. For those learners with devices, let them go through the online learning module, open your um, device for the teachers, okay, check the work of the learners there, communicate with the learners there, go on with your synchronous session, okay, online. So you see, while waiting for the answers from the print modules to come, go uh, do your usual work online for those learners who have um, internet. So the idea now here is that if learning is flexible for the learner, the teaching also needs to be flexible for the teachers. Okay, and if these are all of the scenarios, be flexible as well. Mm. Okay, <laughs> yes. Go okay, ahead, next, Doc Arl, uh, please continue with your presentation. <laughs> Meron ka pa po atang other, ano, other areas to cover. Okay, last area to cover, Ian. Okay, it's with you again. But I don't think, Ian, that you will be able to um, <laughs> go through with um, this one. But let's try, Ian. Okay, let's say, Ian, that I have these two sets of um, objectives. This is not formative and summative anymore, Ian. Huh? Okay, uh, I have here two sets of objectives. You look at objectives in, in set A and objectives in set B. My objective in set A says, um, let's just take on the last objective, Ian. Don't look at the other objectives anymore. Convert moles to kilograms. So the teacher here will now provide, let's say, Ian, five items. Each item there is a given mole. This is in chemistry. Let's say 0.25 moles. 
Okay? And the correct answer iyan, uh, let's say in kilograms, is 0 0.00025. But the student answered 0 0.002. So iyan, is the answer correct? Nako, pag, pag math, syempre dapat specific. Okay, tayo. iyan. The correct answer, iyan, the correct answer in kilograms hmm. is 0 0.00002. But the learner okay. answered 0 0.02. Is the answer correct? Incorrect. Incorrect. And if yeah. the answer is incorrect, Ian, what mark do you usually put? Uh, zero. X. Oh, yeah. It's usually represented yeah. by zero or X. Correct. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Look at the next um, example, Ian, set P. This is the objective of the teacher or the learners, is to sell a new kind of coffee among customers in a coffee shop. So let's mm -hmm. say you have three groups. One group of learners will sell um, the coffee by um, giving a taste test. One group of learners will put up a kiosk on the street so that the coffee can be seen by um, the people passing by. Mm -hmm. The other one, Ian, um, they distributed free samples of the co coffee on the street. Mm -hmm. Now, Ian, all of them are selling the coffee, right? Ian? Yes, yes. Yes, yes all of them are selling the mm -hmm. coffee. But what do you notice with the way each group sells the coffee? The way they sell it is what? How do you characterize it? Um, teka, I know that yung choices, the card, okay. the one All is... of them. All of them are selling coffee, yes. correct? All of them are right. demonstrating the objective of selling a new kind of coffee. But how did they do it? Um, diba? My free the first taste, one. my free sample, yeah. Mm. Okay, so how do you characterize the kind of responses that the student comes up if the objective is sell a new kind of coffee? What kind of answers comes out? The answers for every group is what? It could be different. Kasi, yes, Ian, yeah, yes. Yeah. Uh, their answers are different from each other. Versus, yeah. look at the objective, convert moles to kilogram. Okay? The answer is what? What can you describe about the answer in, on uh, the set A when converting moles to kilogram? The answer should be what? I don't content base, knowledge base. And the answer should be? Specific. And, Mm, there's a single correct answer. Uh, oh, single correct. Right, right, right. Yeah. What do you think we're distinguishing here, Ian? Um, something that is uh, parang books based. Yung parang just tapping the 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 lower levels of knowledge compared to the other one. There's more experience, there's uh, okay. exposure. But, yeah, take note, Ian, those strategies are also coming from the content from the book. Mm -hmm. mm, yeah. And they're just applying it. Mm. Mm -hmm. But distinguish them in terms of the kind of answers produced by the learners. Ah, syempre yung something that is specific versus varied and open. Mm. Yes, yes, yes. Okay, now, if the assessment, Ian, requires a right and wrong answer, what do we call it? And if the answer and the responses are varied coming from the learners, what kind of assessment is that? Do you have an idea? Teka, Doc Hart, baka may alam ang ating mga viewers. Yep, okay. So, yeah, let's now look at the chat box. Okay, so sabi ni Cesar Villarruz, very specific mm -hmm. in set A and open-ended in set B daw. And mm -hmm. then and sabi naman mm -hmm. ni Arvin, uh, J. Reyes Lambarte, uh, ikan, nag -move yung comments, hindi ko tuloy makita. Uh, subjective and objective? Mm -hmm. uh, actually, yes. both are objective, Ian. Because if okay. it's subjective, then it's not a good assessment. Mm -hmm. Ayan. We have some answers that are saying it's uh, authentic. Mm, yeah, set B, not all of set B can be authentic. Like, look at the next one. Construct mm -hmm. a pole that can support a 30 square flat wooden top. Um, it's not authentic because it's not made in a real life setting. Ah. Meron ding nag answer Doc Carl na open ended. Mm, mostly for set B, it's open ended. 
Yeah. But what do we call that assessment in set B? And what do we call those assessment in set A? Um, sabi ni Mark, performance based. Ang set B, and correct? Set B, and set A yes, is? Uh, objective assessment. Mm, no, no, no because set B not. is also set B is also objective. It's okay. correct that set B is performance based. So what do we call those assessment in set A? Okay, so mga kasama, please answer ano daw yung nasa set A. So we have, uh, for set B, it's performance-based assessment. How about set A? Mm, yeah. <laughs> May nag-answer dito, Doc Carl, na traditional mm. assessment. Is that correct? Mm, but set B is also traditional at certain times, but it's a bad name to call set A, mm -hmm. <laughs> to be fair with set A. <laughs> but yes, usually we call that. I mean, it's a Doc Carl, for set A, it's content based and or mm, cognitive. Set B, set B is also content based, and set mm. B are also based on cognitive skills, except that in set A, each item represents a specific cognitive skill. In set B, it's an integration of cognitive skills. That's the difference. But both has content, both makes use of cognitive skills. Mm. So what do we call that assessment in set A if set B is performance? So in depth ed, what do we call that other assessment that we grade aside from performance tasks? Okay. What is being said in the chat box? May mga answers, Doc Carl, na mm. objective assessment. Mm. Both are objective. Written, written, uh, written yes. Set A, Ian, in depth ed, is called as the written forms of assessment, or this is what you usually call as the paper and pen. In, in some textbooks, mm. um, they're called the traditional. And set B would be the performance-based. Uh, I think, Ian, what we're driving at here is that if you're a teacher, Ian, if you're teaching in the K-12, first, I would ask you to distinguish what is the difference between the objectives in set A and set B. Um, usually, this, you should be a teacher should be able to detect that the assessment um, required for the objectives in set A would be written, and the assessment um, that are required to do the objectives in set B would be the performance. So what we're demonstrating here, Ian, is that um, the decision to give a written or a performance-based task depends on the objective, okay? So if your objective, for example, is convert moles to kilograms, it requires a written form of assessment. If your objective is to sell a new kind of coffee among customers in a coffee shop, it requires a performance-based task, okay? On Monday, Let's say your objective for your class on Monday is to sequence the evolution of different operating systems. So it means to say that on Monday, the kind of assessment that you provide would be written. Tuesday, your objective that you're going to teach the learners is to create a program that will compute the grades of students using Java. Then by Tuesday, you need to give a performance-based task. Okay? So that's a point here. All right, let's have an exercise, Ian, with the audience so the audience will have to um, type in the chat box okay um number the number dot and then if the objective requires a written work they have to um, type w and if the objective um requires a performance task they put p so the answer could be one dot w one dot p okay but ian you'll have to um answer for uh why be, be, before we take a look at uh, their answers okay on the chat box uh, after we take a look at most of the answers, then you provide your answer so that we okay. can counter check. All right. Okay, ready, audience? Okay, number one, state the domain and range of a given function. Okay, everybody, send your answer. All right, so Andami Doc Carl nag answer now. For number mm. one, it's W. It's a written task. Now. Yes, it's a written task. Okay, number two. So number your work. Okay, um, solve systems of linear equations in two variables by the graphical method. Okay, so mga kasama, number two na po tayo. What's number your two? answer for number two? So you have to put two dot and then P or W. Okay, everybody send your answer for number two. 
All right. So for number two, majority are answering W10. No, yeah. It's also a All written right. task. It's a written work. Okay. Number three, draw the slope of the given equation. Type number three, dot, and then your answer. Okay, everybody, send your answer for number three if you draw the slope of the given equation. I'd answer it's performance-based. Okay, Ian. Okay, if I give you an <laughs> equation like a quadratic or linear, and you'll have to draw the slope in a coordinate plane, if my if the slope doesn't touch on the right points, then mm -hmm. the equation will change. Iba na yung magiging oh, equation. Okay. Mm. <laughs> so number so three it's still written. is written. Yes, there's ah, a right and wrong okay. answer. So number three is written. <laughs> okay. 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 Um, number four, simplify complex fractions. Okay, everybody in the audience, number four, simplify complex fractions. Send your answer. Simplify complex fractions. You put four dot P or W. Okay, send your answers, everybody, for number four. Hmm. I'm written for me. Yeah, okay. yeah. Let's say, for example, um, you have five and one half. Okay. How do you simplify that com uh, complex fraction? Okay, Ian. What is the uh, what is how will you simple what is the simplified version of five and one half? <laughs> five times two, Ian, is ten. Ten plus one. 11. <laughs> so the answer is 11 over 2. <laughs> okay. okay. <laughs> number 5. Yeah. Parang nakalimutan ko na doctor. <laughs> okay. Number 5. Deliver a speech to persuade people to donate for the orphanage. Okay, everybody, type your answer for number 5. Number 5 is very easy and it's obvious that this is. Ian, what's your answer for number 5? This is performance-based. Performance-based. Okay. Mm -hmm. Number six, multiply and divide rational algebraic expressions. Ako, Doc Carl, I still write mm -hmm. na, it's still a written task. Yes, this is a written task. Number seven, list hazards of working with chemicals. Also a written task. Mm, okay, Ian. So you here comes the it. teacher. Okay, here comes the mm -hmm. teacher and showed the muriatic acid, and then um, there are five of you, and then the teacher said, okay, what would happen, uh, what hazards would occur if you put your fingers inside the beaker containing muriatic acid? List what will happen, okay, in your paper. One student would say, okay, my skin will get burnt. Mm -hmm. Another student will say, um, my skin will have marks. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> written so it becomes, a performance. Yeah, it becomes a performance-based task. Na. Mm. <laughs> yeah, because we're usually um, um, preconceived that if it's the word list, it, list. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah. Right. Um, you have to imagine how the answers would come out. Okay, number eight. Classify the properties of substances as the physical or chemical and extrinsic or intrinsic. Your answer in number... Um, Eight. Uh, written task with it. Yeah, this is a written task. Mm -hmm. Number nine, Ian. Cite evidence of chemical changes. Ah, ako may konting ano, nuance yung answer ko dito, Doc Carl. Kasi mm -hmm. if they can, if, for example, we are in a laboratory, tapos you can mm -hmm. really see yung parang chemical mm -hmm. reaction and chemical changes, then it becomes mm -hmm. a performance-based task. It is performance-based. Let's say I burned a matchstick. Mm -hmm. Okay, there is a chemical change. You have to tell me what made you say that um, the matchstick went through chemical change. So they will say there's change in color, there's change in the texture, etc., etc. Mm -hmm. Okay, number 11. Present ways to prevent walls from easily cracking during earthquakes. Yeah. Okay. I think mas leaning towards performance than ito. Okay. Right. Yeah. All right, Ian. So you can now teach in the grade school and <laughs> um, high school. <laughs> Ian. So that's the end, okay, of um, our presentation, Ian. And uh, yeah, we can now... Um, go through our question and 
answer. So he answered already the question by Sir Noel Psycho. Um, ito, Doc Carl. This is coming from Sarah Lee Pagulayan. Mm -hmm. How will you assess mm -hmm. naman daw learning competencies of kinder students? Hmm. They also have written and they also have performance task. Okay, um, if I will be opening um, our most essential learning competencies, uh, this is actually very broad <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> a question. How do you do uh, the assessment? The, the assessment begins with understanding what the learning competency is. If the learning competency says that the students will, should be able to recognize the alphabet, how do you assess that learning competency? Assessment starts by looking at the learning competency. So if the learning competency says, okay, recognize alphabets, if I flash letter A, students would, should be able to say A. If I flash letter B, the students should be able to say B. That's recognition. Okay, alphabet recognition. And this is an exercise um, that the parents can do at home. So in the learning module, during an offline learning delivery mode, the alphabets are there, okay? And then the parent points to that alphabet, okay? And then the learner should be able to say uh, what alphabet it is. That's how you do the assessment based on the learning competency. Okay, let's say again in kinder, the next learning, so with the support of the parents, of course, um, in a home learning environment, but you can do that one online as well. Let's say that the next learning competency is um, recognize capital and small letters. Okay, so students will have to say again, if I show a capital letter A, the students will have to say capital letter A or small letter A. Or let's say the learning competency would um, entail what is a loud sound, uh, determine, distinguish loud sounds and soft sounds. Okay, so the, parent, the, the learning module will contain examples. Let's say the truck passing through the street. So the, the, the student will encircle loud sound or soft sound. So these are the exercises and assessment that we provide to the learners. So the take on here is that look at the learning competency and again there should be a corresponding assessment for each of the learning competency so the learning competency will give an idea on how the assessment is going to be conducted mm -hmm. okay next question doc carl um could you please suggest a good assessment method in a mathematics class in a remote area like, mm, there uh, is no signal okay okay go yeah. ahead, doc carl. okay there is no um uh, ideal or appropriate assessment method. You only have two. It's either a written or it is performance. Okay, that those are your two forms of assessment methods. Pag mahina ang signal, okay, e di mag-print module, shift to the print module. Kung may signal, then you can shift the modality to online. So again, uh, it goes back to our principle. If the learning is Flexible. The teaching also needs to be flexible. Uh, what was said, um, uh, even uh, aside from the condition that the signal is weak? Continue ko lang, Doc Carla, yung sabi okay. ni Ma'am Jessamy. So, uh, could you please suggest a good assessment method in a mathematics class in a remote area na walang signal, um, mm. inter slow internet connection, and there are no face-to-face -face interaction? How can you be sure mm. that students now really learn the lesson in this module? Oh, you will know if the lessons really learn based on the answers of the learners. If they are not able to answer very well your questions, especially if these are constructed responses, so it means to say they didn't learn well. So what is your next step? If you have seen that your learners didn't learn well, provide feedback, provide corrections, Send it to the learner. Tell the learner to revise again their own work. Provide what they need to read so that they will be able to get the correct answer. That's what needs to be done. Mm. The car is something related then to to uh, issues or challenges in remote areas. How do you, mm. how to do that the video monitoring 
if you're in a remote area. So considering na mahina din siguro yung connection. Okay. There is no um, internet. Uh, internet, And it's a written okay. word. Let's say, for example, there's a right and wrong answer. One is you can convert the right and wrong answer into supply type or constructed response. But if it is not possible, let's say, for example, the learning competence is really to um, say whether it's physical or chemical change, you know, the exercise can be sent um, to another representative who is in that area. Let's say there are 10 items, they give it, and then the learner answers in front of them, and then they give it back to the teacher to ensure that it is really them that would answer. Mm -hmm. So another question, Doc Carr, this is coming from Joyce Tahan Langit. In our case, which is a public school in an urban place, what do you think is a good assessment or good assessment strategies to use that are simple and attract or encourage students to continue with their studies because it's hurting to get the mm. feedback from a learner that they did not learn anything now from the modular approach. Okay, first and foremost, okay, make the assessment short. You need not provide 30 items to 50 items. If you can capture the learning competency in five items or in one question that is constructed, do so. Short mm. and simple. Okay hurting okay the feedback and telling to the learners um, that uh, you did not learn is a bad feedback <laughs> every time ian isn't it that when you give feedback your feedback needs to be constructive when you give feedback you need to give a recommendation what the learner needs to do when you give the feedback, Ian, isn't it that the feedback should give them the specific steps and strategies on what they need to do so that they, the learner will know how to revise their work? If the feedback is clear, specific, okay, and constructive together with your phrase, then the feedback becomes a powerful means to help the students improve their work okay there are some ways on how we provide feedback telling the learner that you did not learn because your answers are wrong is a bad feedback ian <laughs> okay yes uh, perhaps ian uh, they need another round of session on how to give <laughs> appropriate feedback okay Sige po, I'm, I'm surprised to ian i'm surprised ahead, ian Mark. You know, Ian, I'm surprised that the teacher would think that the kind of feedback that we will be giving to the learner is, your work. you did not learn. You don't say that to the learners. Oh, no. <laughs> yes. Okay. okay. Uh, second to the last na question, Doc Carl. Okay. Kasi, uh, limited time na lang tayo. Can you please okay. comment, Doc Carlo, on learning activity sheets? Are these useful for learning assessment now, Doc Carl? Of course, the learning activity sheets went through quality assurance in the BLR and in the VLD. And of course, they are going to be useful. You know, it, they become useful, number one, if you use them. Number two, if you use them properly. And number three, if you manage the usage appropriately. And number four, you monitor the learners well when they use them. And number five, when you check the work, when you provide feedback on the work, then they become useful. Again, the usefulness will depend on how you implement it. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> the car, last question. Uh... Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. Carla. So, mga very useful and very insightful answers. <laughs> Last one, Dr. Carla, kasi limited na lang yung time natin. Regarding the home learning partners, how, mm. can these, uh, how can these be followed or how can we comply given the IATF protocols that we currently have? Mm -mm. Okay. Um, there are some divisions where they seek permission from the IATF where representatives are allowed to visit the houses and there are just some guidelines when they visit. Of course, social distancing and wearing a face mask. And um, second, this can be strategically be done through the PTA. Okay, so the PTA is provided with a set of guidelines on where they are assigned 
some PTAs and parent representatives are given guidelines okay, on what to do and when to distribute the learning, uh, the, the assessment forms to the learner, especially if these are written works. Okay, So if the guidelines are clear, okay, uh, there are some divisions where this is allowed by the IATF. Okay, so I've seen that um, being done. And um, we don't immediately say that the IATF will not allow because um, usually the PSDS or the district supervisors are the ones that seek the permission. They write a letter and they detail the specific guidelines. They get usually approval from the IATF with these procedures. Mm -hmm. Okay, Dr. Carl. So with that final question, um, Meron ba kayo, Doc Carl, na parang parting message or parang, uh, parang parting strategies or tips okay. for our teachers who are tuning in live this morning? Okay. So a uh, majority of the questions, the nature of the questions are actually um, identifying problems and challenges on how to um, deliver the assessment. And that's actually um, helpful. That's actually um, useful. Now that we are aware that these are the challenges Okay, and these are some of the concerns and problems on how we implement quality assessment and making assessment um, accessible as part of the teaching and the learning process. The next step, we now have to go through our next step. And what is that next step? The next step is for the school leaders to think of creative ways on how to make it possible and for the teachers to cooperate and do ways to make it possible as well. And take note that it's not only the school leaders and the school teachers who needs to implement it at this particular point in time. It needs to, you need to get the help of your stakeholders. And who are your stakeholders? These are your PTA, Parent Teachers, uh, parent, uh, parent Teachers Association, parent representatives, other partners that you have in the area to in order to help the learners to implement the guidelines and to gather as much as possible and monitor student learning in the area. In this way, if we are able to um, make learning, the teaching and the learning process work, then we reduce the risk of learning loss. And that is our major concern. Okay, we are doing this assessment, we are doing all of this initiative because we are preventing the learning loss. At this particular point in time, how will we know if there are learning loss or learning gains if we will not make assessment possible? Hmm. 